step back through time with me, if you will, all the way to 2017. A new show, Star Trek Discovery, airs, and we're really excited to see this new Crossfield-class ship. And we don't get it. We're kind of thinking, wait a minute, isn't Jason Isaac supposed to be in this? Where's, where, where's the ship? You'd be forgiven for thinking that actually Paramount, or CBS All Access at the time, was having you on. The first two episodes of Star Trek Discovery concentrate on the Walker-class USS Shenzhou and her crew. And you might be thinking, okay, are we going to follow two ships? Then Michael Mutiny, Giorgio got knived, and the Shenzhou very suddenly wasn't suited for purpose. Despite the first two episodes being something of a mislead, the Shenzhou does continue to cast a shadow over the rest of particularly season one of Discovery, with a couple more appearances peppered throughout. There was enough that we certainly feel this does count as one of the hero ships from Star Trek's Pantheon. So grab a glass and raise one in toast. Rest in peace, USS Shenzhou NCC-1227. Now let's analyze the crap out of you. Number 10, Old Reliantable. One of the lasting contributions that initial Star Trek Discovery showrunner Brian Fuller had was via the Shenzhou, he wanted to create something that would tie into Star Trek's aesthetic past, but was still progressing toward the future. At Fuller's request, the design team used the USS Reliant from Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan as a jumping off point when designing the Shenzhou. He wanted audiences to get that feeling that they've seen ships like this in the past. According to Fuller, we wanted the Shenzhou to be a much more traditional design so that when you got to the Discovery and it looked different, you wondered why it was so different. However, there was another reason Fuller wanted to invoke the Wrath of Khan in this Starfleet design as well. The Reliant has a wonderful history of minority representation. We thought it would be a nice nod to echo its design with the Shenzhou because we wanted to give it a context that non-white Star Trek fans might appreciate. For Star Trek Discovery, the Shenzhou would be a step toward additional representation in Star Trek, both in the name of the ship itself and in her captain, Captain Philippa Georgiou. I wanted an Asian female captain calling the ship the Shenzhou after the Chinese space station felt like a wonderful way of acknowledging the scientific achievement of the Chinese community. Number 9. The Upside Down As the rest of the art department under Mark Worthington worked on the discovery itself, veteran Trek designer John Eaves worked with the jumping off point that the Reliant was to be used as something of an inspiration to both root and expand on the fact that the Zhenjo has its place in Star Trek aesthetic, aesthetic history. Not only that, but he wanted the look of it to establish both where it came in the lineage and in the timeline of Star Trek itself. According to Eves, you'll see some elements of the NX-01 from the past, you'll see some elements of the Reliant from what's to come. I felt it was important to try and tie these time frames together in detailed form to put the ship into context. Eves produced dozens of sketches of the Shenzhou, adapting it, switching it, changing it. However, with most of them having the warp nacelles on top at this point, when Brian Fuller and Mark Worthington both departed the series, only then was Eves able to pin down the final look of the Shenzhou and flip it upside down. Todd Chernyowski was the one that finally gave good direction on it. I did one sketch he liked and we flipped it over and then angled the nacelles. Number eight, the 50s, 2250s. A huge aviation history buff, John Eves took inspiration not simply from Star Trek ships, but from aircraft from real world history as well. According to Eves, production designer Todd Chernyowski he gave the idea of incorporating elements of the old B plane from history into the Shenzhou, which goes a little way toward explaining the unique secondary hull design on the ship. Also, according to Eves, I thought about something that Tony Moore at Edwards Air Force Base told me about, which was a uh, blended body aircraft, where everything smoothly transitions into itself, so the hull blends into the wings and so forth. I thought I'd try to do the same thing, 
So my hole blended with the saucer and that ended up being a nice idea that the producers really responded to. The design of the Shenzhou also mimicked vintage aircraft by the inclusion of various aerodynamic fins along the hull and nacelles. This was directly inspired by the 1950s Cold War era Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. A bank of lights to illustrate the ship's registry was also borrowed directly from 1940s aircraft carriers. This kind of primitive addition was added to all of Discovery's pre-TOS ships including the Discovery itself. Number seven, Underslung Hero. As the Star Trek Discovery team were trying to figure out exactly what the look of the series was going to be, what the ships were going to be designed like, and how they were going to approach everything, the actual design of the Shenzhou itself was used to test new ideas. Early renderings of the ship contained many different configurations and liveries. There were some that had highly accented turquoise colour and some that were closer to the dove grey of the original Matt Jeffries USS Enterprise. There was a much more serious stealth bomber look also proposed that would have had faceted hull panels facing back against each other. Ultimately though, a more traditional Aztec type pattern was used for the hull of the Shenzhou, while even at this stage, they still weren't exactly sure where the bridge was going to go. There were a few different ideas for where the bridge would go in the Shenzhou, including a note from the art department that said, why not put it in a notch at the very front of the ship? That, however, was swept to the side once the producers said, let's put it under the primary hull. According to John Eaves, the notes we got said its bridge should be located at the bottom of the ship. There was no explanation for it, but I thought, okay, let's go for it. The unique location of the ship allowed them to build a practical set that was raised slightly with windows going down under this. These would be looking out onto what would of course later be added in post, CGI starfields almost completely surrounding the crew. Following the release of the series, John Eaves commented on the unusual bridge location and the subversion of fan expectations. When the studio made a teaser trailer to introduce the series, they started by showing the Shenzhou upside down. The Star Trek audience naturally thought they were looking at the top of a ship. Then they showed the ship rotate. Everyone was really surprised when they realized that the bridge was on the bottom. It was a very cool concept and it worked really well. Number six, sooner or lateral. While all five previous live action Star Trek shows had been filmed down at Paramount Studios, Discovery was the first, but not the last, to be filmed at Pinewood Studios in Toronto, Canada. There, a series of elaborate sets were created, like the Discovery's Bridge, the Shenzhou's Bridge, uh, and a large amount of corridors, sick bay, engineering, a transporter room, and of course, Lorca's Menagerie. Because the premiere episodes, The Vulcan Hello and The Battle of the Binary Stars were gonna be located almost exclusively on board the Shenzhou, there had to be a way of reconfiguring the sets so that they could look like they were from two different ships. Now, simple repainting of the corridors allowed the Shenzhou's corridors and the Discovery's corridors to stand in for one another. A reconfiguration of Lorca's Menagerie gave us the brig of the Shenzhou, but it was Discovery's transporter room that went through the most extensive redress for these episodes. It was given a unique lighting scheme, it was given a circular transporter control, and it was given lateral vector emitters, which are more primitive and designed to be used on the much older USS Shenzhou. Fun fact about those lateral vector emitters, in Star Trek's great history of reusing props, those emitters would turn up again in the episode Brother aboard the USS Hiawatha. They would also appear again in the episode The Red Angel as phase discriminators. Number five, a long walker. With the script for the Battle of the Binary Stars calling for an entire slew of Federation starships to face off against the Klingon fleet, John Eaves worked not just to bring the Shenzhou to life, but all of the other ships as well. According to Eaves, whenever we were waiting for feedback on the Discovery and the Shenzhou, we'd do concepts for fleet ships on the side. I'd keep drawing those and we ended up with 60 or 70 of them. I think they said they were going to take six or seven of the fleet ships and build them. If I'm not mistaken, Brian Fuller picked all of the fleet ships and he'd always go for the more unusual shapes. 
In order to explain these ships' enormous visual differences from the contemporary 23rd century ships in the rest of Starfleet, Eves and Cherianowski worked together to come up with a backstory. We eventually came up with a theory to explain why these new ships didn't have round nacelles and looked a bit out of place. We came up with this idea that it was like the old Edwards Air Force Base in the 1940s. All these companies were creating these new X-planes and even though the purpose was the same, they all looked drastically different. So we created this whole scenario that this was like an experimental stage. Up to that point, the Vulcans had been influential on matters of ship design, but now the humans had decided that they'd had enough of that influence and they wanted to go on their own. Consistent with that ethic, Cherianowski and Eves decided to name each of these ships after test pilots of those X-planes, specifically choosing the Shenzhou to be a Walker-class ship, named for American test fight and X-15 pilot Joseph A. Walker. Number four, Good Shepherd. As the first year of Star Trek Discovery developed in the writers' room, the producers alerted the art department to the fact that another ship was required. This is outside of the Discovery, Shenzhou and the fleet. This ship, the USS Curie, was intended to be another experimental Federation starship, and so a unique design was required by John Eves. Returning to early sketches of the USS Shenzhou, Eves flipped the ship over, moved the bridge back a little bit, and placed the engines above the primary hull. The basic lines were a rejected Shenzhou, but I reworked it to be the Curie. Bridging the gap between the Shenzhou and the brand new Discovery, Eves came up with the Shepherd class Curie, which would later be renamed the Kerala and then dropped from the show entirely. Deciding that the experimental ship would be the same as the Discovery herself, the Crossfield class USS Glenn was introduced in the episode Context is for Kings. The Curie, aka the Kerala, would go on to appear at the Battle of the Binary Stars and then would stand in for the USS Gagarin in the episode CV Pakem Parabellum. So, no, you weren't just seeing an upside down Shenzhou in those episodes, but close. Number three, Memory Beta. With two full episodes dedicated to being on board the Shenzhou, Star Trek Discovery's producers put a little more time into coming up with backstories for the ill-fated crew. Alongside series regulars and returning characters like Captain Philippa Georgiou, Commander Michael Burnham, Lieutenant Commander Saru, Lieutenant Junior Grade Kayla Detmer, and Ensign Danby Connor, the crew of the Shenzhou were filmed out with unique character and alien designs to really make them stand out. You had the blue skin Lieutenant Troke, you had the cybernetic Lieutenant Troy Genuzzi, and Ensign Jira Narwani, who would wear the distinctive snail shell helmet that would appear quite a few times throughout the rest of Discovery's run. While most of the Shenzhou's crew go unnamed on screen, a lot of them actually are given extensive backgrounds in the tie-in novel Desperate Hours by author David Mack. According to Mack, this was a deliberate effort by both himself and the Discovery producers to give this crew a sense of reality, which would make what happens to them in the episodes hit home. Most of them I developed on my own along with detailed character bios, backstories, quirks, interests, etc. Those were then submitted to the show via Kirsten Beyer for approval. Some, such as Gant, Detmer and Januzzi, ended up being used on the show. A few, like Connor and Britch Wheaton, were established by the show's writers. Also, Kirsten tells me that the Shenzhou Bridge crew actors were given my bios of their characters to provide a foundation for their performances. Number two, contact with Kaminar. In addition to providing them with brief histories, the novel Desperate Hours also depicts the Shenzhou crew teaming up with Captain Christopher Pike and the USS Enterprise to take on a mystery on the planet Circe III. Despite the aforementioned effort to align the creation of the novel's characters with the show's writers and what we see on screen, Desperate Hours is, like almost all of the Star Trek novels, a non-canon adventure. Still, the Shenzhou did have at least one other mission that we know of, sort of. 2018's short trek, The Brightest Star, sees Philippa Giorgio, then a lieutenant, answer the hail of Saru, who is at this point still living on Kaminar. She lands in a shuttle which is marked SHN-03, clearly indicating that she was serving aboard the Walker-class USS Shenzhou 16 years before the events of the Vulcan Hello. This would make the Shenzhou 
the first ship to encounter the Kelpians. However, the subsequent Discovery episode, The Sound of Thunder, would retcon this and say that Giorgio was serving aboard the USS Archimedes at the time, thus removing the Shenzhou from this very important historical event for no reason that I can really think of. And to add insult to injury, just in case one might think, oh, maybe that's a bit of a continuity issue, no, they removed SHN from the shuttle. Number one, into the wild blue tinted yonder. As mentioned earlier, and in many, many, many other lists, Star Trek sets are so often reused and redressed and turned into something else. While the Shenzhou's bridge was originally designed to just be that, in the true spirit of Star Trek, it would then go on to be adapted for two different locations you might not have noticed, and we're here to destroy the illusion for you. For Star Trek Discovery Season 2, the bridge of the Shenzhou was heavily revamped and redesigned to become the bridge of a Section 31 stealth ship. This was under the direction of new production designer Tamara Deverell. According to Deverell, we revamped those great bones from the Shenzhou set. The bottom of the bridge had been glass, allowing the crew to look out into space, and it was all green screen in that area. There was a bunch of space down there, so I thought, let's take away the glass floor, clean out the green, and make this a two-tiered ship with ladders going up and down. While the Section 31 ship would make numerous appearances in the second season, it did not follow Discovery through the wormhole at the end of season two, so a new use had to be made for this bridge set. In season three of Star Trek Discovery, the bridge of the Shenzhou would become Starfleet Headquarters. So many elements of the bridge had been lost or scrapped or removed along the way, but that central dome at Starfleet Headquarters is the original dome from the Shenzhou's bridge. Well, my friends, that was not the last time that it was used, because as we've seen in the released clip of Una Chen Riley's Court Martial from Strange New World Season 2, the room got reused again as the courtroom. Now, for a bit more detail on that, check out our ups and downs for the second episode of Strange New Worlds Season 2. Back to the main video. And that is everything for our list today, folks. What did you think? Let us know in the comments below. Massive thanks, as always, to the wonderful Paul Sutherland. I do not know where he gets this information. He has some sort of creepy deal going on. And we love him for it. Thank you so much to the wonderful editor who had to take all of these words and make them shine. And um, I really hope he did well. Everyone, thank you so much. Remember that you can follow us over on Twitter at Trek Culture and over on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. You can follow myself at Sean Ferrick on the various socials as well. Don't forget to check out my podcast, The Clone Star Pod, which is available on all of the various platforms and on YouTube too. Until I see you again, look after yourselves. Be kind to yourselves. Be kind to others. Make sure that you live long and prosper. Make it so. I don't speak Latin. <laughs>